2014 school board to um, order. School board meeting to order. Yay. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I am the off tonight. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> and Kate isn't here yet, so Christina, if you would do roll call, please. Sure. Tom Cruise. Here. Alex Ackrey. Here. Daryl Hancock. Here. Anita Jagosinski. Here. Kate Mayer. I think she is just delayed. Tim Mettinger. Here. Lisa Collins. She is excused. And Gary Dunlap. Here. <coughs> Okay, with so five of the seven school board members present, I will declare a quorum. Uh, board norms reflection. Just a reminder, the board norms for our meetings are in your folders. If you want to take a glance at those as we um, prepare to move through the agenda, it would be most appreciated. Approval of the agenda. I would note that the agenda has been posted, distributed, and sent to local media. It was amended on 11-21-14, and we also have a... Uh, change to make at this time, 11.9 um, board policies and rules for review. It's the discussion of summer school. Um, there's no action to be taken, so a friendly um, amendment or motion would be to move that to 12.6 under board member reports and discussion. Um, so, if there are no other changes, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as amended. I make a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. <coughs> Discussion? <coughs> okay, seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Then public participation. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board relative <coughs> to any item at this time? We ask that a five minute time period per person be followed. Please come forward, state your name, address, and topic to be addressed. Seeing no one, then I will move on to recognition and thank you, Dr. Carlson. Thank you. I just want to make a special recognition and thank you to our La Crosse Area Family YMCA for their recent donation of $2,250 to the district. This donation is made because of, uh, in part of our partnership with the Y <coughs> for the use of our facilities during this summer. And so, but again, it does come by way of a donation, so we certainly thank the Y for that donation and our ongoing partnership with them. Okay, thank you. Any questions? <clears throat> right, yes, we do appreciate the partnership. I know they have a pretty um, active after school program in the school district too and it really helps us out um, with childcare and those sorts of things. So then moving on to district administrators report, Dr. Carlson. I have nothing further to add. Just a reminder, you have those happening reports and as you take a glance, it's a great way to uh, keep up on the uh, outstanding things that are happening in our school buildings. Okay, thank you. Then we've got a, four reports this evening, in the evening, moving on to reports and discussion. The first item is LMC report. Do you want us to use this? Sure, yes. Those if you're sitting at the table, but that if you're standing. Testing, testing. Testing, testing. Lisa, if, if those of you see okay, if we those, just sit here and use those, yep. like <laughs> Becky, if she might want to use that as she sits over there. Thank you. Thank you for letting us show off our libraries for the School District of Holman. We're starting with our web page, which uh, includes basic information including our 2013-2014 goal, uh, which was to uh, prepare digital age learners to be efficient and ethical users of information and technology. We feel as if this is a goal that we strive to meet through all different content areas um, in collaboration with uh, many, many people in the school district, including teachers, as well as the work that we do with our students that we see on a regular basis. At any point in time, if you have any questions as we're going through, please feel free to ask. Um, I believe you received these things in a PDF form last week. 
Um, our statistics for the year are very similar to what they've been in the past. Uh, we're showing our school population, the total items in the collection, then the total items circulated. Uh, as we look at those uh, numbers, <coughs> certainly the high school's numbers are, are low only because so much of the work that they do is on online databases uh, for their research, which we will see noted in a, just a, a little bit. Um, and also, uh, there's different policies. Uh, obviously, population affects circulation. Um, each school is different, and each librarian uh, runs her library in a different way to, to see how that uh, item is affected circulation-wise. Uh, circulation includes not only books, but um, technology resources for teachers, um, other professional needs that teachers have as well that are circulated through the library. Uh, we also do a lot of interlibrary loan. Um, these statistics show um, items that we share throughout libraries in the state. We actually pay a annual membership to be part of the WISCAT lending system. And so the items that we send out um, are smaller than the ones that we borrow, which is something that we're always trying to improve and share what we can. But we also do an enormous amount of sharing between our buildings. and. It's very, very common, for instance, as an elementary or a middle school librarian for a student to say, I read this book in elementary school and I don't have it, but I know that one of my colleagues will be happy to share it. Right now, our system doesn't allow us to show those accurate numbers, um, but we're talking hundreds of books that travel back and forth between Randy and his van. He doesn't necessarily like the boxes that he gets every day from us because there are many. <laughs> This is the online database I was referring to. As you can see, um, Aaron subscribes to two additional uh, sources that are highly, highly used in the high school for research. And the BadgerLink resource is a free a database collection from the state of Wisconsin for all Wisconsin citizens to access. We have a few new items in the libraries that we'll have Stacy Eskelson from Evergreen share a little bit about. We are all very excited to have our own um, little free libraries in our buildings. Um, it started with Sand Lake having theirs and then ours came next at Evergreen. And I think Prairie Views is there already and yours is coming at Viking, right? Mine is being rose mulled, so because it's the Viking. <laughs> Um, mine rolled out right before the end of the school year and so I was very excited to be able to share that with my students because they can't necessarily come to the LMC to check out books during the summertime but this was a way for them to um, be able to have access to different kinds of books the premise behind it is that if you put a book into the little free library you can take a book out of the little free library there's no checkout system it's just kind of a uh, honor system um, if you bring something you can take something um, kind of thing um, it's been going really well. I mean, I've seen parents even in the afternoons when they're picking their kids up, they'll be looking through it while they're waiting for their student to come outside. So just another way for us to get resources out to those kids. And also, um, Becky Harris from Viking will be talking about some of the books that you can't see in our collection. We have electronic books in our libraries and our collections, and the kids have been taught how to access those at home if they'd like to. Um, we, we get a lot of hits. They're, they're looking at the books when we introduce it and then it seems like it drops off. And we were talking just before the meeting about that. The kids prefer to read a book. Um, they'll wait, Mrs. Rich said, they'll wait for a copy of the book to come in even though it's available online. So we're trying to do it. One of the nice things um, about, about having those is I can, I can buy a copy of a book, say that um, fourth graders want, the teachers want, and you can have unlimited access for a little bit more money. So the, the teachers can use it in the lab with the whole class and all the kids can access the book at the same time. <coughs> so we have a few books like that. <coughs> I do anticipate that usage going up as time goes by too. Um, but she's right, right now my middle school students even would, I'll just wait for the book, Mrs. Rich. <laughs> Uh, we have a special video to share with you at the end, so we're going to skip over our curriculum video <coughs> and gallery of pictures. But in the resources, we always are trying to stress um, with the public and with our um, staff, and of course you as a board, the different things that we do besides 
check out books. <coughs> and so this is an infographic. I know we've shared it in the past of different things that we do, but we thought that we would each just take one of these little challenges, uh, descriptions of things that we do throughout our jobs and share just a little bit of story about that um, with you as well. Go first, Stacy. I'll pick collaborates <laughs> while you're looking. Um, I'm going to pick collaborate because I feel like that is such a huge part of my job at the middle school. I have the luxury of having what I call a flexible fixed schedule. And so students in the middle school are scheduled into my library on a regular basis. Uh, eighth grade has um, chosen the schedule of coming in every other week with their students. However, they are also um, scheduling themselves in during my flexible days for specific lessons on history day research and um, bibliography creation and a number of different evaluation tools. Uh, sixth and seventh graders and their teachers have chosen to come in every week. And so one of those um, sessions a month, two of the sessions a month are actual teaching time that I will provide lessons for those students and the other two times are just for checking out and reading. But the luxury of the schedule is that on Wednesdays, I have no classes coming into the library that need me, which means I can go out to all of the PLCs in the building and meet with teachers to share resources and hear what they're doing in their classroom. And oftentimes, as I am visiting different grade levels and different content areas, I become the link between, well, this is what ELA is doing. Um, what should we do in social studies that will complement that? or what resources can we use to collaborate with the students in technology um, that will make this a more effective learning tool. And so I'm very excited about the fact that that's part of my job. Um, Wednesdays are something I look forward to because of that adult connection and the, the time that I can share with teachers. Um, I'm going to address the sponsors. Um, we actually had an event at Evergreen on Friday night. The PTO hosted a book swap, and so um, they were encouraged to bring books to the LMC that night. Um, I provided a story, and then after that they had popcorn and drinks, and they could choose new books to take home with them. Um, we had some leftover, so those books are now going to be going out to our little free library outside um, when I get a chance. But that was one special event we've done. I know at the elementary level, we all do book fairs, um, both the Scholastic, which comes to our schools, and um, Barnes and Noble. So we're out in the public and letting everybody else know kind of what we are doing um, that way. Sorry. We have a computer club at Vikings, so I was going to mention that for sponsors. But um, I'll just do locates. I, I love it when pe teachers come into the library and they'll say, "Becky, uh, where is where is Numeroff's books?" And and I'll, you know, just point in the right direction. And like right underneath the clock, N U M, you know. And the, it, it's just so <laughs> funny because they and the kids too. They're like, "How do you know those numbers?" <laughs> but. Um, we, we are experts at locating things in our mm -hmm. library, and if we don't have it, the kids get so excited. If you say, well, I can get that from the middle school. I mean, to get it from the middle school is like, wow. <laughs> you know, so, and I'll show them how to look it up on the computer today. I had a little boy hand me a note, and he said, can you get these from the middle school for me? And, and two books, so, you know, it's, it's just great. We could sit all night and tell you those stories. <laughs> um, what we did instead was, um, we always feel like part of our job is to advocate for our position and and this is a three minute video that talks a little bit about um, all the things that are going on in our school library programs and uh, part of it was also clips that you will see came from the um, California Library Association who is a California is a state where librarians are being cut on a regular basis and so they tried to do um, a promotional advocacy piece to share what they feel is important in a library media director and we added that into our video as well. Why do we need teacher librarians? We're the only horizontal teacher I am. We're the ones who can connect all the different content areas 
blend it together, and also say to the child, what are you interested in? She really ran point on all the professional development, the technology integration, working collaboratively with teachers to develop lessons, either as a group or individually. What I would like to see is that districts start to understand the power that they have when they have a teacher library. Thank you for your continued support. Thank you for your presentation. Any questions or comments? Um, I just actually had a question. Well, thank you for the presentation. It's always, I love hearing from you guys. I just do, and I was really happy to, I don't know if it, it costs more money to have paper books, but I don't like seeing notes. I don't, I just, and Kindles, I'm such a paper book person. I have bookshelves all over my house. I, I love it. So I really was kind of, um, it made me feel good to hear that kids <laughs> wait for the hard copy. <laughs> um, but I wanted to know if you, um, what kind of books do you have in the Little Free Library? Are they, are they just for kids because they're on the elementary property, or do you <clears throat> keep in some like mine at Evergreen? There are some adult books in there as well, um, which happened over the summer. I only went in every couple of weeks just to kind of check on it. Um, and so far, from what I've seen, the kids carrying around, they know which ones to pick and which ones not to pick. And do you ever need our, uh, donations for those? We love donations, yes. <laughs> so could we put in a plug for donations for yes. each school for the Little Free Library? That would be wonderful. And any particular kinds of books you want? Does it matter? Or? Um, right now I know mine at Evergreen's a little low on picture books. We've got for quite a few chapters. For like the kindergartners and the first graders, we're a little low on those right now. Put a wish list together? I don't know. You guys could put them on your page on the website or something. Maybe oh, we could. It's right before Christmas. Yeah. If you don't ask, you don't get. Mm -hmm. So that's we great. I'm really glad you do that. I didn't realize that. So thank you very much. I got three questions. Ann Peterson's oh. father. Yes. Ann Peterson's father made all of the little free libraries. Oh, wow. and Rose modeling. Buildings and actually looked at our buildings and you know, thought about the area and, oh. and what the theme should be. So. That's amazing. Wonderful. That is fun. Very Thank nice. you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, it's probably a basic one basic question. What does PLC stand for? Professional Learning Community. Professional Learning Community. So you on Wednesdays you go around and you meet with different educators and you troubleshoot, collaborate, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
Are you seeing more interest? Second question, are you seeing more interest in technology? I'm the same as Anita, I'm, I'm a hard copy guy. I got books next to my, I have a reading, whatever, but I'm, I like putting it down with a bookmark and come back a day later. But um, do you, are you seeing more interest in technology? We have more access to technology right now in the middle school than we have had in my career here. Therefore, there's more interest. Uh, for a while, we had teachers who were excited to, to try things, but unless we have that constant, immediate availability for them to have um, reliable devices that will work, um, I was noticing that the interest in trying things was, was slowing down, but as of the last 12 months, I have seen a higher interest. Um, certainly the connection that our district has and the commitment that we've made to the Google Apps for Education process has made a huge difference at the middle school. And um, I see that improving and increasing as time goes by as well. I was on the board, the Friends of the Holman Library <coughs> tried to get a better library in Holman and hopefully that will someday come to fruition. It's really a struggle. Um, if you had any complaint, what would it be? <laughs> Um, I, I feel like I have the ideal job <laughs> right now. Um, but for the school system, what would you, if you had a wish list, what would you want? What do you think you really need? Um, I, speaking for my building, Evergreen, we only have one computer lab, and all the other buildings have more than that, and so for us to be able to access that technology, it's very difficult. Technology, um, the techno Yeah, we would like more technology in our building. Um, Especially now, since we're doing more state testing using the computers, um, maps testing is on the computers. Um, what's the other one? Smarter Balance will be on the computers, and so during that time, we can't get in there to even do other research projects or other things. And I know the kids are excited. Um, the last two weeks, I've been working with the fourth and fifth graders um, on getting them into Google and starting to use their Google accounts, and they're really excited about doing that. But we don't always have access. I think I would um, wish for something that you all can't give me, but is time. And um, you could provide more opportunities for staff development in areas of technology, not so much how to use the new tools that we have in our school, but how to use them in a way that improves student learning, that we're not just using the computer because it's there. Um, paper and pen sometimes works better than a computer does. It depends upon the, the need. Um, a book sometimes works better than the internet does. But the staff development is in a high, high need in our district, and I'm not just talking at the middle school there when I say that a lot of this new stuff has come at us, but we haven't been taught the best way to use it. And uh, staff development time is what I would say would be on my high wish list. Thank you. I would agree with that. I, I was sitting here thinking, I thought, I. I'm not even sure what I would wish for. I, I think I just have the best job in the world and the fact that we have paras in our buildings mm -hmm. and we have an LMC director in our, our buildings, I think I've got the best job in the building. So I, I guess I'm not sure what to wish for, but I, I would agree with, with your wishes. Any other questions? Kate? Um, thank you, Tom, for that question because I think that's an interesting question. I love your answers. Um, I think our, our teachers do believe that they have one of the best jobs ever. But I also know that LMC directors, I was going to say are the most overworked <laughs> of all people, but uh, that's not true. But you are. Um, so much falls on LMC directors. Um, number one, your job is to make sure that that library has enough books that every kid finds a book that he or she loves to read and you connect them with that. Number two is LMC directors. I don't think that um, the community necessarily knows how your role has changed. You are the tech leaders in your school. Uh, being a tech leader in your school does need s staff development um, because you teach teachers, you teach <coughs> kids. That's not just what it used to be as being a school librarian. And I think you're in a district that appreciates that. <coughs> this is a school board that appreciates that. Um, we're all fighting budget, but we're also appreciating what you do. Um, you three 
are incredible representatives of what you do to get a kid connected to a book, to get our teachers and paras and everybody else connected to, to a website, to a whatever, to what works best. And I thank you for how long that must take. Personally speaking, just trying to find out what works for me on my laptop <laughs> takes a long time. But you're in charge of that for all your teachers. You give them that. Uh, thank so you. thank you for that. Thank you, Kate. As a former LMC aide, I just want to say my favorite picture was the young lady laying on that furniture reading, the pleasure reading. There was a time that high school, we were told that they just didn't have time or, or the capacity for students to come in and do pleasure reading because they were having to work so much with research. And I just always grizzled at that. And you know, it's been a few years now that they've had the, the um, comfortable chairs and the beanbag chairs. I think they tried it, all of those things. And I just love that because that love of reading is something that will live on in, in our young people forever. They, and it is in a comfortable setting, more like home kind of thing. I think it's great to see that. So. Caption for that picture was, my library is a haven. And I think we could all say, it. I have students who come in before school, after school, at lunchtime, they just need our space, whether it's for the quietness or the belonging, and we're so thankful that we have that space to offer them. So thank you very much. I'm glad you do that. I would just too suggest you stick around for a few items, 10.4. Some of those items related to technology you might be interested in hearing the discussion on that. So I would imagine student stress relief and you're, and you're a center of student, aren't they? Maybe they're stressed out, they might calm down and help them a little bit. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it, in Quiet my room. library, that is, that is very, very true, yeah. Mm -hmm. I noticed every one of them had tall ceilings. Do you have tall ceilings in your, that helps too. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you, much. Okay, then next budget development calendar update, Dr. Carlson. In addition to those three, I was just going to acknowledge Aaron Foster, who walked in as well. So thanks, Aaron. The first item is also part of the reason why your agenda was amended for this evening, because we also have that included on the consent agenda, asking for your consideration for approval tonight. Actually, specifically, it is under um, uh, I, uh, num part five, where you see the undermet or underfunded needs rank selected, and looking at those dates, on the initial one that you had approved the calendar, those dates were in more in October, and we've had some reason for cause some for some delays, and so um, part five has been moved um, about a month later, and so for example. You can see that part C under that is this evening where I'm presenting that uh, to you. And, um, and so we'll be presenting that list uh, in just a minute to you and then be asking under part D or item D for your approval at December 8th. So tonight though, it's just this revision of this calendar asking you under consent to approve that minor revision. It, it does not change. I think we're still on target for um, looking at preliminary budget and uh, that target date. And so this is just dealing with our um, unmet underfunded need list, the reason for this change in this calendar. So any questions just on this revised, these revised date changes on the calendar? Any questions? Okay. And that will be, again, part of your consent agenda this evening. Okay, then the preliminary budget district-wide ranking order of un or underfunded needs. So 
So this is uh, an important part of our development, our budget development process. And as I just noted, with the revised budget development calendar, it does call for a presentation to the board on the rank order of the district-wide list, list of underfunded and unmet needs for your review and input. And the board then would be asked to approve this list at the December 8th board meeting. This aligns pretty close to the timeline for a year ago as you went through this process as well. So the purpose of this calendar event is to provide the board with an opportunity to view the needs identified by budget authorities, again, principals, directors, supervisors, that continue beyond the priorities that are already planned for within the allocations uh, um, given to those buildings and departments under the um, planned budget. The board considers the list of needs and provides administration with direction on what to perhaps reprioritize from the submitted list that should be considered in the budget process. So as part of the board approved budget development process and calendar, again, those budget authorities that I had mentioned submit need requests that go beyond what the budget authority has already determined as a priority to be funded. I then score and rank the request based on the above, the approved rubric criteria that the board has approved in the past. And then I present the rank order with the board for review and approval, which is uh, tonight. I'm going to just bring up a couple documents that are included in your packet, and that just kind of shares with you the process that we go through. So here, for example, is the detailed list um, that, that everybody submits, and they submit it to Mr. Miller in the business office, and he then compiles and puts this together. And again, I know it's too small for, that's not the purpose tonight for everybody to be able to read it, but it goes through each uh, department, building, budget authority. They submit this um, ultimately to me. And then we apply this. This should look familiar, hopefully. This is the rubric that, that I look to to try to apply uh, most of these under the criteria column. You'll recognize those as under our focus areas. And, um, and so that's an uh, important document that I try to, that I do utilize when I um, score and rank. So the finished product then is taking all that and coming up with a list, um, which is really presented to you this evening um, for, your, for your review and your input. And so again, um, looking at this, you can see, for example, this is in order of total score. And over on the left side, it's, that, it's really the building or department that it originated from. The second column, the category or need, it really is a, just a very, very brief, more for me, a brief description. So if you go back and look at that detailed list, hopefully you can match this up um, and cross-reference it. And so as you see here, um, I also included then uh, the, the approximate cost that the budget authority had submitted along with uh, their request. And then the total score that um, resulted from a, applying that rubric, and then the rank. And so this is in order of the rank by building and department. So for example, um, items that were submitted out of instructional services, beginning with classroom resources, and that might be a variety of things, but again, materials that support the classroom directly, as well as staff development. So those were things that, um, as I applied that rubric, ended up scoring the highest. And then you can work your way down. I would suggest, though, that just because an item perhaps didn't rank real high doesn't mean that we can or should automatically ignore it or perhaps um, um, move it. And I. I I'll come up with, I'll share some examples uh, on my next slide when we get to that point. So this is again the document ultimately that supports your issue paper, 
on what you're asking to review and then on December 8th approve that list. Feedback that you might provide once you look at this list. Uh, you might have questions specifically about the items, or and but you may also say, Dale, um, we need to make sure we address that item. Um, and so um, what kind of plan do we have in order to be able to do that? And that might involve us going back to um, rethinking some of the things that we have been doing and perhaps um, consider a funding plan of making this work. So um, you'll see the issue paper then just again references the rank order and you'd be asked on December 8th to approve that as presented or if you have recommendations or requests to make modifications to that. So questions? Just, I'm just, oh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. So here's the, here's the um, slide where I just tried to summarize some of those needs. So staff development, instructional resources, enhancing the level of instructional technology in the district, which you're gonna hear more um, in a little bit on the agenda as well. I, I mentioned vehicle replacement and facility maintenance as examples that um, as you look closer to these, um, much of what we have to do under these areas are more or less mandates. And so you'll see even on that prioritized list that I might mention the word mandate on a couple of items. And in the end, if we don't take care and make sure we're managing these areas, it will, very, it will impact those higher ranked um, areas as far as instruction and staff development. And then staffing, it's a, it's a mixture of needs ranging from secretarial to instructional. I do want to add that one position you will not see, even on that detailed list submitted by budget authorities, um, but remains high on the district, um, on my list and on, on the district's priority, is that position that would be dealing with assessment, data management, that I know we have talked about. In the, and so I'm in the process, we're in the process of continuing to examine that possible position and the board uh, may expect in the future a proposal which might be as part of the 2015-16 staffing plan and, and budget. So I did wanna mention that, but again, you'll see as you take a closer look, um, a mixture of staffing with that. So your next step as a board would be to review this list and consider approval at the December 8th board meeting. And questions? You, since you mentioned the specific position, could you describe that for the board again, um, at least the initial thoughts, the data uh, position? Yeah, we, we're still in the process of putting a, a real description together. And quite, you know, we are, we are, um, you have guided us as, as, as far as everything that we're doing and, and leading and making decisions is based on data. But it's not just that, we have so much more that through student assessment and uh, our continuous improvement efforts, where um, you look out here and you'll see so many that are directly involved with our PDSA work and really looking at data to lead us. <coughs> And so doing much more than ever before with this, and we are managing, but we're, we have so much, so much more that we could do and do it more effectively, and to provide support to all our areas in the school district. So Mrs. Hancock, I'm not given a very detailed description because it's still in development, but it's really to assist all of us um, in really um, leading us and making those decisions based on data. So we, we still have work to do on, on that description. And when you talk about decisions, it's decisions across district-wide data that's used to support whether it's instructional services or pupil services or administrative decision-making. This is a position that would support all of those areas. Well, that's part of the, the work to really um, zero in on it. There's no question, in my opinion, 
the majority or quite a large part of it would be specific to student learning and assessment and in that piece but as you well know including the board's recent work on their own PDSA and looking at data um, this we do need to find support for more broadly across the district as well but I do want to make sure that we start with the focus on student uh, learning and, and instructional practices yeah, I just know the model I'm familiar with where you have an institutional research person or department right. and it is across the organization, Correct. the whole organization, while the 95% of the work or 90% of it may be um, about student learning or for supporting student learning, it may be those different components of the organization that is looking for that data to be able to support them in the work they do. So. Correct. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, great. Thank you. So then the next item is, I have to see the word. Oh, here it is. The fiscal sustainability goal. Mr. Clark is going to present on this. I think it's been a while ago that the <coughs> board had expressed an interest in um, some of the information that Mr. Clark is bringing to us this evening. I don't know if Dr. Carlson, if you had any introductory comments, you want me to go ahead and get rolling? I'd be happy just to make a couple comments. Really tonight, and Mr. Clark will most likely repeat some of this, but um, really the focus of the presentation begins with coming back to one of our six focus areas fiscal sustainability and it was about a year ago where the board um, really worked uh, mr. fail was here with us and we actually brought in community members and got input and as a result we revised the board revised its strategic plan to include six focus areas and we then the board went about the work of uh, writing specific goals for each of those and as that's one of the first items Mr. Clark will go over is progress made on this goal that was established officially back in January. And but this goal was incomplete. And now we have some numbers that we want to present to you. And this has taken a while. A lot of work has gone into this and a lot of work will continue with this as we go down in the coming weeks and months. Thank, Thank you. you. And so Dr. Carlson referred to last January, the fiscal sustainability goal, and there it is. By June 2019, increase revenue per pupil, amount to be determined, asterisk, as measured by budgeted revenue divided by current year pupil membership. And the asterisk, please note that, was intended to provide further guidance in completing the to be determined portion of that goal. This is what the asterisk read. A realistic amount of dollars that deliver value, an amount necessary to improve student learning and or <clears throat> customer expectations, starting with the unfunded needs in January. And January at that time was January of 2014. Since the board approval of that draft, administration's been working to identify the to be determined amount. And, um, present that amount to the board. In presenting the recommendation on the per pupil amount, um, we've predicted some questions that might come. Hopefully those will be the same questions that come to people's minds. Questions like, well, if we're gonna generate this additional revenue, how are we going to use it? Because revenue without a purpose might be problematic. And what will be the added revenue, pardon me, what will the amount be and what will the revenue be used for? And so the balance of the presentation focuses on uh, the recommendation being presented here tonight in terms of the dollar amount and then speaks more specifically to the per pupil amount and those two natural follow-up questions that we looked at. So before I move on, fiscal sustainability goal by the board understood the background. The question is then what's the dollar amount? Okay. Heads, nodding, yes. 
So the uh, amount that's being presented is $263 per pupil. We believe that that's a realistic recommendation uh, by administration. It's based on $990,000. That's an annual amount divided by approximately 3,800 pupils. That gives you about $263 per pupil. We believe that the appropriate way to generate these dollars would be by a referenda question. Um, if all could go as planned, presented to the public at the April 7th, 2015 general election. The referenda would ask for authority to exceed the state revenue limit for the purpose of funding operational expenses. This is different than referenda that are held for building projects and bonding authority. This is for operational expenses. Operational expenses would include technology, facility maintenance, and fleet placement. Probably no surprise to you after seeing this year's prioritized needs list, and in fact, the prioritized needs list for last year and the year before that. It's most responsible fit to fit the objective of this goal into our long-range financial plan. Uh, this cannot stand on its own, but has to be integrated to the long-range financial plan we have as a whole. Uh, therefore, this recommendation would be a phase-in of the revenue growth over a three-year period. Resources to fund technology would be introduced in 2015-16. The facilities maintenance and fleet replacement resources would first become available in 2017-18. That delay is in part aligning it with the long-range financial plan that we have. That's slightly ahead of the 2019, remember the statement of the goal, fiscal sustainability <coughs> goal, but we believe achievable within the long-range financial plan of the district. So if we have a basic idea of what's being recommended, I'd move to what we thought would be those natural questions. Why do this via a referenda? Why 990000 And why these three items? Okay, going on to that. Well, why a referenda? Revenue limits. Um, state law determines that public school spending is really driven by revenue limits. They truly limit the amount of money available to fund school district needs. Revenue limits determine about 91% of our operational budget, meaning you have about 9% that's controlled by other factors. And honestly, of that remaining 9%, it's largely defined by categorical aid, grants, and entitlements. And these types of revenue sources can be referred to as having strings attached. That is, the strings limit what we can use the money for to qualify for the revenue. So under state law, the only method available to exceed revenue limits is to seek public permission via a referenda. Second reason for a referendum is really the $990,000 amount is unattainable by other revenue generation methods. As I said, you got revenue limits, then you have largely controlled by these strings attached funding sources. In fact, the facility committee was one that went through an examination of alternative funding methods, such as increasing facility use fees, or advertisement in schools, or gifts, or grants, and they went through a long list. And really the challenge with most of those is they're not predictable or sustainable. Yet most of our needs are predictable and sustainable. So administratively we felt they just aren't a good match with the needs that we have. The revenue stream does need to be predictable and dependable as the items that are being proposed for funding. So that's why we think referenda is the correct direction. Go, well, why $990,000? Why not 500,000? Why not 2 million? Why 990? It allows for the additional revenue that we're talking about generating to be generated without a net increase in taxes. And we thought that might be kind of an important part of a referenda presentation. So that was the first thing that defined the dollar amount. 
This amount fits into our district long range financial plan, including the tax levy plan. It aligns well with the retirement of long term debt and debt reserve fund use. We do need to remember to be cautious of the impact that generating this revenue will have on our fiscal effectiveness result measure. If you remember, we present this to the public at our district annual meeting in our annual report. The fiscal effectiveness result measure could be called our return on investment to the community. It takes the performance of the organization and divides it by the amount of money we spend. And by generating this additional revenue, we will spend more. And so this is one thing we need to be aware of, the impact of this on our fiscal effectiveness commitment as we move forward. The point being, if you went above $990,000, you now have to demonstrate an even higher return to achieve your return on investment goal. And so this was, in some ways, a limit to how much money we would generate. I'd also remind the board that our demonstration of trustworthiness and responsible behavior to the public in the past that has earned us success in past referenda. And so each time we present a referendum, our trustworthiness and responsible behavior serves as the most effective means to ensure success. And in many ways, uh, <coughs> this referenda and the presentation of it to the public will predict our success in future referenda beyond uh, the one proposed uh, by administration here. And so then the next question is why technology maintenance and fleet? Uh, first item here was delivering value by sustaining efficiency in our maintenance and transportation programs. Those two programs, when compared to regional school districts, demonstrate efficiency levels better than our neighbors. 79% efficiency, that is lower cost, cost at 79% of the comparables for maintenance, and 63% for transportation. <coughs> <clears throat> Deferring maintenance on buildings and fleet will create an even greater drawdown on our resources and we won't be able to sustain these efficiencies. If we're not able to, we'll end up having to take dollars that would otherwise be directed to instruction and the other prioritized needs in the district. So as much as it is an expense, it's an investment in continued efficiency. Examples that have been presented to us demonstrate that deferring $1 in maintenance today will lead to $4 in future repairs. Question then is if we don't come up with $1 today, how will we possibly come up with 4 tomorrow? This also addresses items that have long been appearing on the annual budget development unfunded needs. And this applies to technology maintenance and fleet. We believe these recommended three items are consistent with the community stakeholder input received as a part of the strategic planning process. Community focus group was brought together and asked what was important to address. These are the types of items that came to the top. As Dr. Carlson mentioned earlier tonight, under the un and underfunded needs, uh, the reality is that maintenance and transportation services are mandated by state law. And uh, we'd have little choice but to invest in these. The question is, will you do it today for a dollar or tomorrow for four? We also believe that clarity is an issue when developing a referenda. Having studied the referenda other districts and interviewed administrators in those districts, they repeatedly told us that the reality of what can be observed by the public, that is, I can touch it and I can see it, is an important consideration in presenting a referendum. Comments like people want to see the bang for their buck. They want to be able to touch it and see it. That influenced the selection of the items. There are many other on and underfunded needs deserving of attention in this district. The items selected for presentation of the public are just believed to be the most defensible in a referendum. It does not necessarily, as you saw from the prioritized needs list, suggest that they're of more priority than other items. Best match for a long range financial plan and best match for a presentation to the public. I would mention by funding these items, we'll also be reducing the competition for the limited resources we have within the existing budget. 
competition that exists between student learning and mandated services such as maintenance and transportation. So those were the three questions, and if this is something that the board believes is a direction to take on the fiscal sustainability goal in amount and revenue generation, then here's some suggested activities that the board might consider. So at December 8th, the board approved the fiscal sustainability goal to include the $263 per pupil. On December 8th, the facility committee could review the facility component of this if the board wishes to assign um, portions of this proposal to various committees. December 15th, the finance committee could review if the board wishes to assign that to a committee rather than dealing with the finances at the board level. And then the technology committee could review on the 18th, meaning that by the time of the second board meeting in December, we would have also had legal counsel review the referendum resolution wording and the board could begin to take some, make some preliminary decisions at the December 22nd <laughs> meeting to review the resolution wording and review the follow-up reports by the Finance, Facility, and Technology Committee. January 26th is an important date to keep in mind because if you're going to target an April 7th general election, the board's action must occur 70 days prior to that election. And so while some of those other dates may be adjusted, the board could have special meetings, that's a date that you really need to keep on your horizon. If this is a direction you wish to go, that is an April 7th <coughs> referendum vote. So questions, comments? This is mainly for the facilities, you're, this referendum you're talking about, right? No, in fact, if you looked at the dollar breakdown of this, and there's many details that go into this, uh, $655,000 of the 990 is related to technology. Okay. Okay. The balance is divided between transportation uh, fleet and maintenance, uh, so greater than 50%, almost two-thirds goes to technology. Okay. Hard, hard, <coughs> hard goods, more or less. <coughs> Pardon me? Kind of like hard goods for the, for the, that's what I meant. Not exclusively, um, but yes. Um, uh, uh, and, and more details on those types of things. We're, we've actually been working very hard and uh, engaged the administrative team in the development of some Q&A items for this. And uh, just don't have those ready. And, and, and frankly, they might be cart before the horse. If the board doesn't agree with $263 per pupil, it, Presenting to the board and the public a list of Q&As probably wouldn't make much sense. Uh, but those are great questions, all items that would need to come out in the details of this to garner public support. Any other questions or comments? Tim? I have several questions. Please. Um, the proposed referendum, is it a one-time expense or is this a reoccurring multi-year? Th th this is open for board discussion to the preliminary plan we have identifies the tech two questions the technology question would be for a specific duration of time and the maintenance and transportation would be an ongoing question much like the maintenance and operational cost when we constructed school buildings um, second question in, in the in the information we had gotten your deck was slightly different on uh, where you said the Y 990,000 okay. on the deck I have it says no tax increase on yours it said no net tax increase yeah, would oh. you like to explain the difference <laughs> and would you also like to explain how there is no net tax increase yes. through a referendum like absolutely this? Um, yeah and and as we've studied other school districts who've gone down this <coughs> Uh, path of trying to fit it into a long-range financial plan this becomes very important for the public to understand because nine hundred ninety thousand uh, dollars approved under the revenue limits is going to be raised in taxes to have no net increase what you have to do is structure that at a time where you otherwise would have a drop in your taxes so that there's no net increase I'm not asked to pay any more 
than I paid the prior year. But I won't uh, um, experience the reduction that would have otherwise, occur <coughs> otherwise occurred had I not approved this referendum. And why is that reduction occurring? Um, boy, this is, th these are good. These are all in the Q&As already. But um, let, me, let me go on on these two a little bit. The um, debt service, <coughs> our long-term debt service tax levy is falling off because we're paying off Sand Lake Elementary School. The bond on Sand Lake Elementary School is, uh, Sand Lake Elementary has matured. And that provides us an opportunity, a window of time, where we can introduce this tax without increasing taxes. There is one other mechanism, and you remember we've, <coughs> Mr. Mettinger, you were on the Finance Committee when we did it, debt defeasance. Mm -hmm. And we actually did some things to maintain a level tax rate in some years, putting money into a debt reserve fund to get the technology started next year before the fall off in the debt levy occurs, we would use some of that debt defeasance money in place of a current tax levy to reduce the debt levy and um, infill that with the technology levy. Mm -hmm. Now that might, sometimes when I start talking the finance part of it, some people just um, shut down and and we have some illustrations that walk people through each year and then show the state aid impact in each year but I know having been the treasurer um, you're aware of uh, those two mechanisms so that's how we achieve a net no increase in taxes and several questions from that but obviously looking out on the buildings and ground future building needs we we don't feel that this is going to have an impact because in the past we've always had that drop when we had another building on the horizon so that we didn't experience a large increase when we went for a new building. Are we looking at any long-range negative implications from that by taking that gap and saying well, we're going to use it for this referendum and not have that available when another building comes down the road. If we were going to fill the entire drop that we're going to experience with a referenda question, that might be a concern. But this is a relatively small portion of that total drop, allowing us the capacity to continue to meet facility needs. And, and then the last question I have here is when you talk about that increase of 263 revenue or you could expenses per pupil, do we have any comparative data to show how the Holman School District compares to other data in that same metric? Yep. And how do we fare? Um, we're still putting that information together, but that is, again, one of the things that we want to look at. I will just tell you for a lot of reasons right now, I personally am not a fan of a referendum. Um, and I would need a lot more data before I could be convinced to do so. Um, I, I, such as that. I mean, I would want to see where we compare. I would want to see a lot more. I, I personally am not a fan of this as a mechanism. Um, you know, to me, and, and excuse me if I speak for just a moment, if I may. I, as a board member, I've always tried to be very independent, um, uh, down the middle. My friends on the left don't like that. My friends on the right don't like it. It would get me thrown out of Madison by my own party if I was that way. But that's the way I've tried to be. Um, I've tried to not be that, and I've tried to look for, for common middle ground. I, I have supported a lot of things on this board in the past. I have supported reduction of class sizes, as we just did, that had some major budget implications. I've supported increasing teachers. I have supported um, um, adding more teachers to the classroom and hiring more staff down the road. I have not supported some, some other things. I have not supported the increase in the um, health insurance expenses that we recently have had. For us to go to the public that has seen reductions in their workforce, that has seen their cost of insurance going up, that has not seen pay raises in excess of the cost of living, which I did support and voted for as well, where we gave pay raises in, in excess of what was the maximum amount required under negotiability, which most people are not seeing. I've supported that. 
So I've been very independent. There are a lot of things I support, but I cannot support saying we're going to go to the taxpayer who has not seen their wages go up in, in average in addition, who has not seen their health insurance costs go down or had more given to them, who has not seen you know, more staff but less staff to do their jobs. I, I just can't support doing that at this time. We make choices. We've made some tough budget choices. I've supported some, I haven't supported some. We make budget choices. We have to live by those budget choices that we make. And I'm comfortable doing that. I'm not comfortable saying we made budget choices, now going to the public saying, well, because of our choices, we need more money. And I'm not comfortable doing that. Well, we hope to hear all the questions you have and hope to provide information, just as with the community if it should get that far. This is about educating people and, and everybody making their choice. So um, our, our largest goal right now is to make sure everybody has the information they need. So please let us know what we can provide. Other questions or comments? Um, question I have, Tim, you make me think of questions. Um, when I read, as a member of, we're all members of WASB, and so we see referendums across the state, and there are lots more than there used to be. Why is that? I mean, this is maybe sounds like a simple question, and maybe the answer is huge, but when a public says, why are you asking us for referenda all the time? Not necessarily in Holman, but the increase is there. What is lacking that causes school districts to do this? I know Tim mentioned because of our choices, and, and I do, of course, agree with that, but I think it's bigger than that. I know that we have had to deal with a budget that is pretty tight over the last several years, and choices we make sure. come because of the kids. So, so Mr. Just Mr. a Mr. common Mettinger. citizen like says, why, why do we have so many referenda? <laughs> what do you're, you say? You, you're right. It comes down to choices. You can discontinue doing something to fund something else you want to do. What I've heard again and again is that most people are happy with the things we're doing. They don't want something eliminated. And I think that resonates with other school districts that go for referenda, too. Uh, they support what's going on. They're, they're very pleased with what's going on in the organization. Um, they don't want to discontinue anything. Um, I'll say 25 years I've been a school business manager. In the old days, before revenue limits, we didn't go to referenda because the board had the authority to increase or set the tax rate, low or high, wherever they wanted to. That changed. You no longer have that authority. So in years ago, where you made and made that decision right here amongst you, you don't have that authority anymore. The only way you can do it is a referendum. And so that's why you see more people going to referendum, because they don't have a choice. And before ref and, you know, before those limits were put on us, was historically did school districts raise those limits? Oh, they, I, school boards did. Needed? School boards annually set um, <coughs> limits, sometimes increasing, sometimes reducing. I don't know that I can say I have the data on. All right. How often increased and how often reduced? If you listen to most taxpayers, they'd say there's only two certain things in life. <laughs> One's a death and the other has to do with taxes. Uh, so most people would say that prior to revenue limits, taxes continued to increase. So when we believed that there was something as a board that needed to be funded, but it would cause a raise in the limit, we had the right to be able to do that before. Mm -hmm. But we don't anymore. And so that's what I'm I'm asking this because I think a lot of the public doesn't understand that. So when you mention technology or transportation or whatever, we're telling our citizens we really believe this is right. We're making um, adjustments in other departments, but we believe we need to raise, we need to ask you for more money because this is important. 
to our children. And we can't just do it with a vote anymore on the school board, right? We have to go to the public. The second part is correct. You can't just do it as a board. The first part, that decision is one that lies first with each one of you, and then should a majority of you approve it, then it lies with each member of the community, whether they want these things to be a part of what we do. Thank you. Gary, did you have any questions? Nope. Anita? Um, <clears throat> my comment was uh, I went to a um, training at CESA about, I don't know, six or eight months ago, <clears throat> and we had some elected officials there, and, and there were a number of school districts from around this region there. And one of the things they talked about that I've always wanted to mention, and I was never really sure of the time, but this seems like the perfect time, what people don't realize has happened in our state in the last few years is that <clears throat> with the funding being cut, they don't, they don't feel the pain yet. They don't <coughs> feel it because school districts are really good at adjusting. We're really good at making do with what we have. We're so used to doing so much with so little that we're still doing it. And we're doing, we're doing a lot with almost nothing. Pretty soon, it's going to get to the point where the parents are going to start saying, well, why are you doing that? And we're getting to that point with having to go to a referendum. Everything is related. I think parents will not realize it until we get to the point which one of our local elected officials or our region, state officials suggested, you know what? Parents will realize how dire it is in education when you finally maybe suggest cutting co-curriculars. They will not realize what it's like in schools with the funding until you say to them, listen, we don't have money anymore. We are going to cut out co-curriculars and parents will go, oh my God, what are you talking about? They don't realize. And, and I know we pay our teachers, we, we gave them an angstrom above what we were legally without um, going to a referendum able to give them. As a board, we were able to legally give that to them. I mean, a pittance above what we could give them. We didn't give them 5% more. We gave them points, like 0.001% more. So to make it sound like we gave them way more than we could have is not a true statement. You get what you pay for, though. If you continually give little, you attract the, the the lower the lowest segment of the teaching society I don't want to do that I don't want to attract the less the the, the people who come here because they <clears throat> because the people who can get paid more are going to other districts and we get whatever is left over I want really good teachers I don't want to pay them a pittance or 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 whatever I want to have great teachers I want to keep the great teachers that we have so I'm sorry, I know I'm rambling, but until things become painful for teachers or for parents and kids in our district, and I don't want it to become painful, but until it does, they're not going to realize. And I know we have made choices. Those are my choices, and as an elected official of 17 years, I fully own the choices I've made, and I'm proud of them because I'm proud of the education that all the kids in our district are getting, and I'm, I'm proud to say <coughs> that the people who work here I, I, we employ them, and, and we have done whatever we could to retain these employees in our district. So I, I personally would be more than happy to support a referendum to finally get some technology and finally maybe catch up on some maintenance and finally get some fleet. Tom, did you have any questions or comments? Um. <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of referendum either, but if you can, in my opinion, if you can, um, if it's something that is going to enhance the flexibility, the malleability of the education, excuse me, um, and possibly other, incorporate some other ideas into it, and I'm not going to go into those right now, but uh, um, if it, I agree with Anita too, you have to, you get what you pay for. Um, you have a, um, people aren't making any money, then they'll be less motivated and, and it's, 
if, in my opinion, if you're going to put money in anything, if it's going to be in a child's education, that's really important. But uh, we have missed, at the same time, we've missed opportunities. And I think the school needs to focus on being as um, flexible and student-centric as possible, and that might be some harder decisions with school start times and, and, a long, and a different calendar. And there's just things we have to look at as as a business to some degree. I don't want to say it's a business, but we do have to look at how we approach education. Um, there's, there are organizations I've read where there's tens of thousands of teachers that are doing different things in different states, in Illinois and in Minnesota, that are just phenomenal, that are just completely off the table on how we are as a district in some ways. I think we. Every time I'm out in the field with different people, and I'm going to go to the uh, alternative education tomorrow and have a turkey dinner, and I and I send a detailed questions to Carrie, the uh, director out there, and the, Bryce Prairie. Of, I want to know what she's doing, and what and how she can make her um, her school better. But um, and I'm just I'm kind of quiet because I'm always learning something. But. Uh, the, Sue, um, Sue is, um, is Ricochet Rabbit in her department. I mean, she's constantly going. <laughs> um, it's just, there's just so many opportunities we have to, we have to be, be more proactive and, uh, and I'm just absorbing things. And I have got a lot of suggestions that I'm gonna make and some of them won't be popular, but I think they'll make the school system stronger. But uh, we have to definitely pull from our information from our, from our uh, the teachers and I, I think we have to heavily invest more in technology, but at the same time with the media center, ladies, face-to-face um, -face and the social is huge, so we, we can't lose that variable too. So that's my ramble for this evening. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Alex, did you have anything to add to this? I think it's important to stay up to date with technology so the students in the school district isn't left behind, because that's happened you know, in other places, and I, <clears throat> personally am experiencing um, the challenges that come with a high school that's sort of starting to age and start to show its age. Um, and so I, I'm not a huge fan of referendums demanding money from the people, but you know, like you said, a dollar now or four dollars down the road. And it's, if it's money we need, then it's money we should get because you can't really put a price on a quality education for our children. Thank you. Tim, it looks like you want to speak. I, I just want to clarify sure. so that there's no misunderstanding, um, especially in light of some of the comments that came after me, that I truly, by my votes, want quality teachers. I want good educators. And I'm almost offended that the comments behind me seem to insinuate differently. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. Well, I know that. Um, it's been a couple, we were working on these in January, and we also then charged the, the administration to come to us and bring some information about referendum specifically related to technology. Tim, I think as you remember, we were talking about the one-on-one -on -one or the one-to-one -one technology and um, that it, it's not been the philosophy of this board that we should open up technology to the students and have them come with their technology and utilize it. So the option then is for us to provide it. And this is one of the ways that we can do it. Otherwise, we're looking at $650,000 from someplace. And so as we charge the administration to come with these, and that's just one example, the maintenance and the, the fleet are also things that we have been hearing about for years, about the need to maintain our, our plan and we you know have taken a step back on the fleet and not ordered as many as we had originally said because there have been some of those priorities that have been higher needs and we made those decisions. Um, and so those are the sorts of things I think that the administration is responding to in this um, in what they're bringing to us and, and a solution that would be amenable. I love <coughs> referendums. <coughs> because it's the community getting a say. You know, we are voted in and elected to represent the community. And we, yeah, because we don't do opinion polls or focus groups, you know, for each vote we have, 
the opportunity for us to hear from our community is when they elect us and re-elect us, but it's also when they support referendums that we put out there. And to me, if these are priorities for the community, we would know if those referendums were successful. So how better than to find out what's important to the community um, as far as education and in some of our lapses than to ask their opinion through a referendum. So that's my little, my little spiel on this. So, I, you know, I think the timeline is very um, aggressive. We talked about, Dr. Carlson and I, we met briefly and talked about this, talked, to, you know, we could do it, we could make these decisions as a board without going through these committees. Some people think we're elected to do that, we sh that's what we should do. Or we could, as the, the flow chart suggests, you know, use, using and utilizing, and you know me, I'm that mantra of always including our stakeholders, that sort of thing. Um, but it is possible by the timeline that we have to take this to um, the fiscal, um, or to the finance committee and uh, at the facility committee and the technology committee and to move forward on that for some more specific things before we would pass the, the language and that sort of thing in January. So I think what the administration is looking for is do we want them to move forward with this? We wouldn't take a vote until again, that January time period is whether or not the referendum is actually going out. But what they're looking for is guidance on should this information then go to these committees. And so I'm looking from and seeing a couple head nods, yes. No, you don't think? No, I don't think the time. I think that I hear so much about the school being cut, cut and their expenses and stuff from the state of Wisconsin. <clears throat> When in you know when I hear the state of, of like Holman got cut eight hundred eighty thousand dollars, we actually got cut eight hundred eighty thousand dollars, but the difference was made up with uh, change in benefits for the employees. <clears throat> so the net the net cost of the school district was zero. So I hear about the school district being cut eight hundred thousand dollars for a year. That just was not true. <clears throat> they were cut eight hundred thousand dollars, but they provided the income to bring the, that level back up to where it was. That, I was on the finance committee that year, <coughs> and uh, there was no net change to our, our, our budget that year at all. Uh, we have $51 million a year to spend. Uh, we have 11, that's over $11,000 a student, and that's comparable to everyone in the district, in our area, in the MVC. If, if you paid attention to those charts when they were presented at the <coughs> annual meeting, um, we were very close to the top. Uh, I remember Bangor was over $12,000 a student. But if technology is coming forward, <clears throat> and, and I'm not, I don't know the answer to this question, but if technology is coming forward and say that technology is helping us educate the students, it seems like costs are gonna be shifting from, from some place to technology, to technology spending. Well, where's that shifting going to come from? Do we need, do we need smaller facilities? Do we need, to your point, longer school days? Do we need fewer staff members? Do we need fewer teacher assistants because we have better technology? And we haven't looked at any of that yet. Um, so I think there's some opportunities out there to take a look at first. <clears throat> so I, I I'm, I'm, I'm with Cheryl too. I, I, I like referendums for that reason. You can say. Well, the school board is kind of torn. Um, it makes sense, it doesn't make sense, so on and so forth. Put it out there and let the public say yeah, yes or no. I, have, I really don't have an issue with that. I just would like to look at some other things first. But as far as putting a referendum out there and saying, I'm a big believer in that. We always talked about the referendum for technology or the referendum for this or the referendum for that. I'm a big fan, if you're, if you're struggling with it, put it out there. <laughs> I don't see the harm putting it out there and let, letting informing the public and saying, you know, we're not sure of how the public is going to react to this. We don't feel really solid one way or the other. Um, I don't know how to term with this. Why don't you help us out? That's kind of what I look at it as. And if they say, you know, we don't like that idea, then we go, well, maybe we should look <coughs> at staffing. We should look at et cetera, et cetera, and find some other ways to make the money. So if they say, if it's overwhelming voice saying, yeah, let's go for it, then I have no issue with it either, you know? So are you I saying it was kind of a circle? It was. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess what I'm asking is, should it, is 
you know, the majority of the board feel we should continue on in this study. Um, they've presented a process, activities, and timeline for us to do that, Gary, exactly what you're saying, basically. Um, but in order to pass it in April, this would be the timeline we would need to, or I'm sorry, in order to pass it to be able to go to referendum for an April referendum, this would be the timeline we'd need, and then, um, but so we could say no in January. Well, we take, let's take it, I guess, we, let's take it forward to the next level and see where it goes. And I think that's all we're asking. And, and at yeah. this point, I'm obviously not in support of it today, but I am never opposed to getting more information and, and I just don't want to mislead somebody to think that we're going to say yes in January. But there may be some information that comes out that might change my mind, too. I always keep an open mind. Tim, there might be information that would change my mind, too. Mm -hmm. so, so I, I totally yeah, agree. I'm not opposed to more okay. information. Sarah, so could I just clarify? Yes. We are, if you look at that timeline, while they're, while they're closely associated and connected, we are looking December 8th to complete that goal now, the, that's different mm -hmm. than you as a board um, taking action on referendum questions. Right. But of course, there is a, a direct link with the two. Um, but the, that next step would be an opportunity on the 8th for you to come together mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. provide, you know, real and truly should we continue going down this, beginning with that uh, amount per student as we're stating in the goal. That's just. Um, that doesn't get into specifically, as Mr. Clark said, how necessarily by just approving that goal. But we thought tonight we needed to get going with that conversation with the how. And so um, for us to make these things happen, it still comes down to that dollar per student amount. Um, so technically, you know, you can give direction and take action on that goal. That would be separate than your official action on referendum questions. Gotcha. Thank you for clarifying so. that, Sue. Kate? A, a question again, you know, for the many thousands of people that listen to our board meetings. <laughs> <laughs> the um, dozens. Yes, the, okay, the dozen, well, the, the two. Um, I, I like Gary's questions in terms of, you know, shifts in cost, should there be a longer school day, do we need fewer EAs, smaller facilities, but then also you mentioned too, like we're talking about a timeline. So when you try to get the answers to those questions as a voting member, I mean, it, it comes down to me deciding, do we need to vote for this because there is a timeline, or does it seem so questionable that I need those questions answered? And if those questions need to be answered, how long does that take? And I don't know that there's an answer for that. Is that an ongoing thing that eventually I need to decide, do I, do I vote for this when January comes up? Because yes, I do believe the committee, the committee says there are needs and this is what we need. But then do we continue to ask those questions? I think so. To make, I mean, is that kind of what we're looking at here? Okay. If, if yeah, I, I think so. I, I think you would always do that at budget time. That's what you do is you identify what are those ongoing costs and are those the same number as they were last year or right. if we've got a, um, we're using technology now and we don't have as many students in a classroom for for that purpose, then we would, those are things we would annually look at. And the at reason well. I ask it is, <coughs> is I don't want the citizens to think we don't do that. Right. You know, and I know you don't either, Gary. I mean, we're always, we're always looking at those questions, like what can we get by, what do we need more of, but what could we get by with in the less category? Yeah. We are always doing that. So. Thank you, Kate. Thanks. I did have a question that um, related to that goal. So if the portion, because you've talked about there being two questions, and one of them is a, a date certain goal, and the other one is an ongoing maintenance and the fleet is an ongoing, then um, would there come a point when we would read that 283 or 263 would be reduced because now that technology money 
has come to an end and we've used it all and we're correct so we just annually again looking at our goals would know that that may be it result and as mr. Clark mentioned that goal specifically talks about by 2019 mm -hmm. we will work to achieve that amount it doesn't necessarily mean and I think as mr. Clark alluded to that's going to happen in the first year right. or perhaps in the second <laughs> but by a date we are looking at that and how long I agree that that would be adjusted and does that only include the <coughs> referendum dollars or annually we're able to exceed or we're able to set a um, budget at X number of dollars per students more than the year before Are you using any kind of calculation on what that might be or not the second okay. as we developed this recommendation we focused only upon the additional revenue above what is allowed under the revenue limit okay all right any other questions all right then thank you mr. Clark so then moving on to consent item we have is it 11 I'm sorry, there are eight <laughs> items. We did remove that last one, board policies and rules for review. So eight items under the consent agenda. Mm -hmm. are, is there an interest in pulling any of those out? Otherwise, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda <coughs> as presented. I second I second it. You move that <laughs> motion? <laughs> I'll second it. All right. A motion has been made and seconded to approve the consent agenda as presented. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Board member reports and discussion. I'll call on board members in order of roll call. Ask to you to present <coughs> any comments or committee reports that you may have. Um, Tom Cruise. Finance committee. Yeah. Um, we had a nice meeting. Um, we're ahead of schedule. I, uh, um, Jay Clark had made some decisions or he came up with some stuff about uh, empowering the staff. John Daly, I think that's his name. Yes. And um, he's, uh, that's, I think we'll streamline that part of uh, the school system. I'm excited about that so we can get, um, they're still going to do all the bidding and all that, but. Uh, uh, we're just a productive machine on the finance committee, man. We just go. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you, um, Alex Akre. Did you have anything, um, Alex? Are you an Eagle Scout? <laughs> no, I didn't have time to change. Um. <laughs> well, I like you in your outfit, your oh. uniform. <laughs> Thank you. It's a uniform. Uniform, yeah, out, not an outfit. <laughs> <laughs> I said um. a uniform. If anybody was wondering, out of the ten area schools. Um, we're ranked six for um, cost per student. Um, La Crosse, I believe, is the highest at 13,800. Um, and Toma, I believe, is the lowest at 10,600. And we're $2 more than the state average, according to last year's statistics. Um, so just that. Um, it was a pretty big week last week. We were very excited. Um, we got the new urinal, and I don't know if you've, I'm sure somebody's heard me talk about it, because it was a very long struggle. First the <laughs> urinal, well, it had a baggie over it, then it was on the floor detached from the wall, then it was back on the wall, but it wasn't plugged in. It was, but we finally got it, and it works very well, so we were extremely excited. Um, we took a whole posse of people down there, and Mr. Gillespie told us to leave. So yeah. That's all I had. John is just smiling. <laughs> Boy, John. Anything else, Alex? Nope. That's, that's all. Anita. I can't follow that. <laughs> I got nothing. Okay. Um, Kate Mayer. I'm trying to get myself back together. Um, thank you, Alex. That was really cool. Uh, one of the things that I read in the status <coughs> report is that Alex, you're a Mr. Congeniality. <coughs> Alex is not listening to oh, me. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I was Mr. Because Congeniality. He's a Mr. Congeniality. Because he's Mr. Congeniality. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, you were like the Mr. Congeniality yep. of the... Um, Mr. Can you Homer? talk about that a little bit? Um, I mean, 
Well, Mr. Holman, we raise money for local charity. My charity was the Holman Historical Society. They're working right now to get themselves a museum, so very happy for the Scholzies and what they're trying to do. Um, I didn't win. I was Buick the Enclave. I read Minds, and that didn't beat. Um, the winner, Mr. Holman, was Chuck Sarowskis. He flexed his pectoral muscles to music. Um, <laughs> Again, learning. Yep. So we we have had talk about urinals and pectoral muscles, and we need some girl representation wow. from you next time. <laughs> now, congratulations on that. Um, that's a cool thing for you, um, and thanks for thanks for doing that because that is good, a very good cause. It's a great. I'm, ma I'm making light of it, and I don't mean to, but <laughs> but um, you're very fun. Yes. It um, <laughs> I was late tonight because I was helping someone on the side of the road. And as I, as I do that, I think of buildings and ground. You know, as a former retired teacher, there's so much more extra work for buildings and grounds right now. I mean, you could say that probably with any season, but with snow and making our environment safe, just a thank you. Please share that with everyone that, that works there. Um, I'm going to go straight to bus drivers, too. I mean, there's a bus that comes by my house four times a day in the middle of the day and in the, no, six times a day. <laughs> um, just thank you. Thank you for all those people. And finally, the other one, when you think of weather, are the EAs that have to go out at recess time and greet the buses in the elements. They can't not go outside. They go outside. Um, you know, and these these are not necessarily the people on our highest pay schedule but there they are doing what they do to make it better for our kids so I thank them so much um, and quickly policy and resolutions we do have final choices that are going forward for WASB for the WASB lobbyists to promote for what we would like for our school boards um, I'm expecting that final document to come to me and I will forward that to all of you um, so that I know in times past, our school board has always said, whoever goes and is our representative, go and vote for what you want. But I, I would encourage us to give feedback to the person who's voting. There's, there's some of the items on that are hot ticket items, you know, and if you have an opinion on them, whoever votes for us should should know that that this is what Holman is saying about these items and it ranges from school boundaries up in Michigan I guess in the in the UP Wisconsin <coughs> school districts are being taken by Michigan with boundaries yeah really? yeah I mean there's some really interesting stuff and so we're going no you can't do that <laughs> yeah, if, if, a, if a student is closer to a Michigan school district than they are to a Wisconsin school district where, you know, you get your money for that, Michigan is going, they're recruiting parents oh, sure. to get students to come to them. There's the recruiting of teachers going on in shortage areas. Average. Tech teachers are being recruited and smaller school districts are losing their specialist teachers <coughs> there are items like that where we're saying we need to protect this so um that's coming up and that's it thank you anything on sulk did you want to bring to the board um just still that the last meeting we had we directed our members to talk about if a subcommittee is formed what would that look like and who needs to be on that and i will always go to those of you who have been on the board longer than i have to decide how to do that uh, the other thing is that conversation did come up um, about funding because when we look at student teacher ratio that's a financial issue yeah. and that committee subcommittee that is formed needs to have someone on from those committees be on that committee. We also talked about the, the balance between what do we believe is true with research, what research is good, who will bring us that, and if it's costly, but if we believe it's needed, then how do we fund it? Because we're talking about funding 
I mean, we've hit that several times. So um, that's where we are with that. And so as Kate is talking about the class size policy, the discussion about having a subcommittee that's going to be looking at that and basically um, tr for the board to give them a, the direction of why are they looking at that we made a decision you know last spring or whatever and it's because really you know we didn't do the decision in the normal process we um, it wasn't necessarily a permanent <coughs> solution but it was a solution for what we were being presented at that time and so the committee is going to be looking at that, looking at the old old policy and comparing it to what we had a, approved and then using research, as Kate has said, and information and input, um, making them, bringing a recommendation to um, the board sometime this spring, you know. And also I think that piece that hasn't been part of class sizes in the high school level, you know, the uh, minimum do we have a minimum expectation or are we, you know, right now we don't, but it is, are we okay with single digit classes running for five students, nine students, or 10? Just one or other it, piece yeah, too is, yeah. is really gathering the research about what other districts that look like right. us, what is their policy? And just as we um, have that discussion, we, you know, had recognition this last week about our AP and how well we did in that program, and that's a low enrollment program where okay. we have low numbers, but are we, very successful. We've had the discussion for. too. Um, different levels look differently. Yeah, exactly. Elementary, early childhood, high school. I mean, um, a policy might look different for each building. Right. But that's that's kind of complicated. So we're just gathering. Yeah. So they're, they're looking at <clears throat> forming a subcommittee and, you know, with the appropriate, as Kate mentioned, appropriate representation versus having um, uh, experts come in and present information who may not necessarily be part of that committee, but at least provide information and feedback and, and that sort of thing. But um, I think you'll probably at the beginning of the new year have a plan for that and you know we understand the timing and as they start to look at numbers and and all of those sorts of things as the new year comes um, we want to be um, responsive to the district administrators and and um, leadership teams needs as well so well and then i did have a couple things um, personnel and governance did meet we had a presentation on health insurance they're looking at um, you did I skip you? I'm sorry, Tim. Tim. That's okay. Well, let me just finish, and you can go after me. So um, health insurance, they're starting to look at those things. I skipped Gary, too. That's all right. Just okay. If you don't like us, you don't like us. Okay. I'm trying to move the meeting along. You guys, are always, you're the, you guys are the ones who always tell me how I run the meeting so long, and now I'm trying to skip you to keep moving. I may not have any comments. I'm sorry. Well, anyway, health insurance is being looked at, and, and Jay and um, his team is uh, looking at options um, <coughs> and going to be bringing, you know, for some information to our committee um, and the board in the next, I think, December and January are the key months so that we can have some maybe resolution and ideas and, and go out to the work with the companies sooner than um, last year so that um, in response to our staff needs and in interest have a little bit earlier um, information as well we did continue to discuss the paid leave policy and are moving forward on that and I know dr. Carlson is working on that with the employee relations committee and we'll be providing some information and feedback to our committee at the next meeting um, and then some employee handbook language which you approved earlier this evening was part of our um, our meeting as well um, I also attended the TIF, the Village uh, TIF District meeting, and that has been approved and is moving forward. So that was the shortest meeting I've ever been to. Seven minutes <laughs> is what it took. So the Village really, you know, does the bulk of the work, and um, nothing had really changed since they presented it to us at the last meeting. So it was um, a seven-minute meeting. So then let me go back to my agenda and... Tim Menninger. I have nothing. <laughs> Actually, 
very, very funny. I was going to have nothing. But then after Kate, no, so it was, it was after Kate, I, I did have a comment. Um, I was off, uh, I had the day off today. And um, I, I was driving by the school late in the afternoon and was watching people come out of the parking lot. And I, I saw this car come out onto McHugh off mm -hmm. from the road here, fish tailing all the way down, no snow off the windows, only the windshield wipers were on, could barely see. It just, everybody be safe. It's winter, drive responsibly. So just a, a caution and a warning to everyone. Uh, it, it, hurry, okay. it is winter. I thought you were gonna say it was Gary. <laughs> I was gonna say, how did he get the right? hurry, all right? <laughs> and, uh, and then on a positive note, just everybody have a great Thanksgiving. Enjoy the holiday. Hopefully you all get time with the friends and family and uh, have a terrific Thanksgiving. Thank you, Tim. It's that kind of meeting tonight. Um, and then Mr. Dunlap. I'd just like to have, make sure everyone has a safe Thanksgiving. Remember with the new snow, uh, everybody learning how to drive all over again. It's a new experience, apparently. <laughs> and then uh, you mentioned uh, something about the Historical Society, and I've been meaning to say this for the last couple of meetings, that those the bells at the schools, I just love those things. They're so, cool. they look so yeah. nice there, and you can really step up and ring them too. I found out. Yep. I, went, I rang a couple of them. On of the course, way. you did. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think those are really nice, and it makes you think about the history of the school district and stuff. I just want to mention that. It does thank of you? Of course, I did. <laughs> I know the historical society. Yeah, they they are they did a lot of good work on that. So. Okay, so then moving on, school board um, committee written reports, you've received those. We received correspondence from Ehlers, who's the company that were, is working with the village on the TIF district and the invitation to the academy on the prairie um, for Thanksgiving tomorrow. Um, meeting schedule, we have a December 3rd workshop with Matthew Fail. And we, I should have mentioned this. I think we did some good work at the last meeting where we're talking about processes. And one of the things that we're talking about tonight was data and um, how important it has become. And Matt, the school district where Matthew Fail works, he's got 10 people on his staff that do data and that's all they do. Well, they have 30,000 students, of course. Wow. But if you look at it, we're just over 3,000, so we should have one if you're looking and comparing. And so I thought that that was, he didn't say, he just kind of said it in passing, but it really stuck with me since the last meeting. And I know we ask for data a lot and just being more respectful of the time that it takes um, for staff to collect that and versus someone who works in it every day their, you know, the efficiency of having someone. So it, it just continues, data, data, data. Um, it just continues to crop up on us, I think, and, and is important. So we are going to continue to work on a form or a tool that we're going to use as a board then to determine when we're asking for data from our administration, if it exists already someplace and all they have to do is, turn, you know, turn us in the right direction, that's one thing. But if it's something that's going to take a day, eight hours of someone's time or a week of someone's time to collect, that really to give some thoughtful consideration to that before we move those on. And, and I think this is gonna open up a great conversation with our leadership team because we don't know. I think sometimes we ask for this data and we just assume it's at their fingertips. But this way, we'll at least have that opportunity to have that um, conversation back and forth. I remember forth. him asking us, if you ask for that, and it is an eight-hour job, then you need to know what they're giving up mm -hmm. it's to funny, provide that. During the meeting tonight, I emailed Jay for some data. And I almost <laughs> emailed him a second time and said, I don't want you to spend more than five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I won't email you that, but please don't spend more than five minutes. <laughs> So that is something that we're working on, and I think it will help us with our efficiency. It's under our PDSA, which is our communication tool, and um, working together with the leadership team on that communication and data-driven um, decision-making. 
So Matthew failed December 3rd. If as many board members could be there as possible, I know this has been on the agenda or <coughs> on the calendar for a few weeks now, so it would be really good to have um, as many of you there as possible. December 8th um, and the 22nd, we have school board meetings, January 12th and the um, another school board meeting. And then the 21st to the 23rd is the um, State Education Convention. I know that I'm going for some time. Um, I won't be there the full time, but Tuesday night and then leaving again on Thursday. And if you let Christina know, um, she can make accommodations, but it's really a positive thing for us. Um, we do have, as per our agenda change, the summer school policy up for any discussion. Kate, your um, SALT committee is going to be looking at that. Was there any major changes that were going to happen on that, or was it more just housekeeping that? And I, at this have to tell me. I'm not sure. At this point, we are still collecting administrative um, feedback input into that to have that ready for the committee meeting. Okay, but the policy as it exists, I, you know, don't. Is there any major changes? If there are, of course, you'd come to us and let us know so that we can give some guidance to that committee. I, I would say that there is some discussion about uh, whether it's simplifying, but even, but referencing. The employee handbook when it comes to that administrative rule there's parts of it that we think could streamline that administrative rule and and also make sure it's in line in line with what the language we have on staffing and so on with within our handbook for summer school okay, okay and then just board meeting reflection you know, I, as we reflect back and think about the meeting this evening, um, we, I did the norm where I went down the line. I tried to make sure because it seemed that everybody had, was interested. And, um, and I know Tim, then I made sure that you got to speak at the end instead of in the middle there again. Then you skipped us for our comments. <laughs> and I skipped you for your comments. And so, man, alive, I need to have a <laughs> I want to just add Maybe a, a bigger I, thing here. Jay, Tim, bringing all that up, it, it was a healthy discussion, and I don't think you have anything but the best interest of the school in mind. I, I, I truly feel that. So. Yeah, and I think too. You know, so many times we, it, it's good discussion. We've got to have that discussion because if we don't, <laughs> someone in the community is thinking the things, the questions we're having, and that's we just do a disservice if we don't bring those up. So I agree. I, I think tonight was a. Um, a fun but productive uh, set of discussions. Good. So, with that having been said, having been said, Kate, would you read the executive session motion? I'd be so happy to. Be it resolved that the Board of Education moves to executive session as per Wisconsin Statute 19.851C for the purpose of employee performance review and contract renewals slash non renewals. Is there a second? Second. And then if you would do roll call, Kate. Tom Cruise. Here. Alex Zachary. Oh. Here. Oh, don't do Alex, Sorry. but keep going. That's okay. Yeah, I'm just like, I don't have that on my agenda, so I'm just going off the last one. Um, Cheryl Hancock. Yes. yes. Anita Jagosinski. Yep. I'm here. Tim Minniker. Sure. Yes. Lisa Collins. She's absent. And Gary Dunlap. <laughs> okay, so we will have a five-minute break. It still will be before 9 o'clock, just for the record. 